This particular lab and discussion is so straightforward, I'm not even going to give you a diagram. We've pinged between routers 2 and 3 here on an Ethernet segment, 172.23.23.0/24. And now we're going to work on blocking some pings, because we can do that with an ACL as well. We just need to be careful for more than the obvious reasons, as you'll see here in just a moment. So let's go ahead and just block. Let's say that we don't want anybody pinging router 3's Ethernet interface. So let's go over to router 3 and start working on that particular ACL. Little different than one we've done before. And we're going to do a deny. And don't type IP in too quickly this time because what we're actually working with with pings is ICMP, the Internet Control Message Protocol. So we're going to deny ICMP and we're going to do the any anything, any source, any destination. We don't care. We just don't want any pings coming into Ethernet 0 on router 3. Now we've got a whole lot of choices we haven't seen before. Not a situation where we need to know all of these, but there are so many different ICMP message types. The ones we are concerned with here today are echo and echo reply. The router is even nice enough to say, hey, echo is ping. I like that. Uh, but don't look for ping, say, where you should be looking for ICMP. You need to know the protocol there. But we've got all kinds of other variables with ICMP that we can match on. But we're going to stick with those two, echo and echo reply. I told you there were a lot of them. And starting to miss uh, standard ACLs now, huh? <laughs> And we'll just go with echo right there. And that's it. And then we'll do another line for echo reply. And you can just type that right on the end. There is a little dash there. Of course, we need an accept all line or allow all any. Allow all any. Any, any, that is. And so far, so good. Now we'll go ahead and apply it. We're old hands at this by now, and we're going to do that coming in. And that's it. So let's go over to router 2 now and see if router 2 can actually ping those AC, those uh, that address any longer. And it can't. We're getting the old u.u.u. .u .u. Let's run a debug during that and see what we get, if we get any additional information on that. As you know, someone who's trying to ping us like that it may just be trying to gather information. If they happen to be on there, we're seeing the same thing we saw with u.u.u .u .u before. We're seeing sending and receive. The reason I mention as far as gathering information and why we block pings in the first place, because there are plenty of servers out there that if you try to ping them via their host name or their IP address, they're not going to return the pings even though, you know, obviously they're up and running. One reason for that is that pings can actually be part of a destructive network attack. You know, there are, there are all kinds of ping-based attacks. And what we do with a lot of outside interfaces, say on a serial interface facing the net, it's like we just put an AC on there. It says we don't accept pings. We're not replying to any of them. We don't want anything to do with it. We just want them blocked. Another reason that you might ping around a network, and notice I say around a network like inside, is gathering information. It's called a reconnaissance attack or a recon attack. In a recon attack, you're really not trying to destroy anything right then and there. What you're doing is gathering information for a future attack. And if a potential attacker has your IP address ranges on the inside of your network, the IP address is on the outside interfaces of your network, it makes their job just a little bit easier, especially those interior addresses. You really want to be careful with those. So it sounds like we should block all pings for all time, and that's it, right? And it's not quite that simple, and you also have to be careful with where you put these blocking echo and echo replies. Because right now, if we ping router 3, excuse me, router 2 from router 3, what are we going to get? And we didn't write a tricky ACL or anything like that. We're denying echoes and echo replies from coming into router 3. Let's do a U all there for no debug. And let's go ahead and ping 72, 23, 23, 2. 
and we're not getting anything, but we are. We also aren't getting u dot u dot u. We're just getting the five timeouts. So if we wanted to see what was going on there, we could run a debug IP packet, send it on, and here we're getting something a little bit different, actually totally different, well, totally different actually, from something we've got before, from the ping results we've seen before. Now you're seeing access denied in here, and we have not seen that before on any ping replies. We've seen lots of other things, but we haven't seen those. And notice that they're going out with no trouble at all because we have this access list filtering inbound traffic, right? So it's really easy to look at a ping and say, oh, you can send a ping from you know, out this interface. There won't be any problem. Well, yeah, you can send the ping, but can the ping reply come back? And as you're seeing, it can't with the ACL that we wrote because when the echo replies come back, they're coming inbound and they're getting picked off by that ACL. Debug IP packet even shows us that. They're access denied. And you can see it is the packets that are coming back that are being denied. Notice the source of 23.2. So the source, router 2, destination, router 3. There's the default length, access denied. So we were able to send packets, but we couldn't get anything back. And this is why you can't just go bananas or your favorite fruit about blocking pings on the inside of your network. It's tempting, but here's the problem. When you place a lot of those on the inside, you're hindering troubleshooting, and if you don't happen to be around and you're the only person who knows those lists are on there, then someone else can waste a lot of time troubleshooting. Because if I came in here right now, you know, what's the first thing we do when we start troubleshooting? We might run a show command or two, but basically you're going to send pings. And all of a sudden I'd be sitting here saying, boy, you know, um, you know, three can't get to two, two can't get to three, what's going on? Looking for an access list might not be the first thing I think of. So maybe next time it should be, maybe not the first thing you think of, but certainly the second or third, because it's like that's where the debugs come in. Because uh, I know I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of a dad lecture here uh, with the router, that's perfectly fine. It's, this point is really important because that's why I'm showing you the debugs now and why you want to see debugs like debug IP packet now. Because otherwise, you know what you're doing. You send that ping, it doesn't come back, and, and you're doing this. You're just doing show config, and you're kind of hoping to get lucky. And you're kind of hoping to spot it. Well, in a lab, you know, the config isn't going to be that long. Maybe you can, but on production routers, you know, it could be 10, 20 screens long. You don't want to be doing that. I mean, that's hard enough on the CCI written exam, believe me. <laughs> I'm not speaking out of turn. I mean, they give you some really big configs in there. And if you were just trying to eyeball them and see the one problem out of a 300-line config, you don't want to be that person. You do not want to be that person. You want to be the one who looks at it and says, well, it's a little puzzling. What's going on with debug IP packet? Well, of course, you don't run that in a production network at a peak time. But when you run that, and it's helpful in labs, especially as you get more complex with your labs, all of a sudden you're running, it's like, you know, what's going on? When you see access denied in a debug IP packet output, bang. You're just like, oh man, we got an access list somewhere. That's why I'm so big on you working with some debugs this early in your studies, because you really see what's going on. You're, you're not just putting in commands and saying, boy, I hope this works. Most of the time they do, but on occasion they don't, and that's where the debugs really come in handy. Let's take a look at some other access list lines, because I want to show you how granular you can get with these babies and of course these are the extended and let's do a permit and for the most part we've done IP and we just did some ICMP but if you're concerned about port numbers if you're going to use those that's where you got to come in with choosing TCP and UDP because that's where those port numbers are going to appear and if I choose TCP here I could say any host and then you're getting into you know any destination or you know am I matching source ports source the source ports on a given port number that's equals for EQ uh, GT greater than am I matching only packets with a greater port number there's even a less than match only packets with a lower port number there's even a not equal value match only packets not on a given port number so if you're trying to block every port except uh, Telnet, you know, you could put NEQ23. 
Granted, you're probably not going to do that very often in the real world, but it's a good skill to have for the exam. And you could even put a range, but instead, if we put a destination, we'll look at all these things we can match on. Uh, I mean, the, we can even match on bits. You know, the ACK bit, the FIN bit for TCP, there's the push bit, reset bit, synchronization bit, urgent bit. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost crazy. But let's say that you want to match packets on a given port number for your destination since we're on that side of it because what we looked at before was the source. So now we've got our source IP address is any, source destination address is any, and now we want to match on a certain port number. Well, there's your EQ. And here is a not complete list of port numbers, but it's good to know that it's there. And you can put either what you see in the left-hand column or you can put the port number. It doesn't matter. Now, this is a good little tool when you have a live Cisco device. If you're thinking, oh, you know, I don't want to look up whatever the uh, Echo port is. What is it? Well, here Echo is 7. If you need it for some reason to permit a block on that, you could. Now, this is not a substitute for knowing a lot of well-known port numbers or a good number of them that we've gone over earlier because you're not going to be allowed to carry a Cisco router in the exam room with you. <laughs> that's, that's not going to work. I'm pretty sure that's not even going to get you past the door. So again, you know, there are some port numbers here that you're rarely going to match on, but there are some here that are fairly common. Of course, HTTP being 80. There's Telnet at 23, a good one to know. And of course, FTP data connections used in frequently 20, FTP 20 and 21. There's DNS at 53, and again, some ports, you know, BGP, you'll learn that in your CCMP studies, goodness knows, because we, um, we create adjacencies on TCP port 179. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself there. So again, the, the port numbers that we've looked at throughout the course, you know, that we looked at earlier uh, when I gave you a little bit of list of ones that were good to know, I believe that was in section one, make sure to know those because you'll, you'll see ACL questions. I'm hardly speaking out of term when I say that. And knowing your port numbers and these common port numbers and common protocols is an excellent idea. But again, the, uh, the options are almost endless when you start getting into TCP and UDP and matching them with ACLs. So I tell you what, on the next video, we're going to take a quick look at dynamic access lists. That's really beyond the scope of the CSENT, but you've seen it in the iOS so many times. I just want to show you what it does. It is a handy tool. And then we're going to configure a time range based ACL. And that will just about do it for ACLs. I know this is a huge section and there's a lot for you to learn, but it's just like I said on the very first video, if you win, I'm not going to say if, when you learn the, the fundamental rules, they all work the same way. The syntax is a little bit different here and there, sure. But when you have those fundamental rules down and you remember your implicit deny at all times, you're gold. I mean, you're going to nail the questions on the exam, I have no doubt. So let's go ahead and tie this video up now, wrap it up, and I'll see you on the next one when we'll talk about dynamic and time-based ACLs.